patented in 1908, this particular comfy slipper by Daniel Green was so popular that it continued to be produced for almost 40 years. A few months ago, I acquired this pair of antique slippers and thought it would be the perfect project to do in the middle of winter. And it is a surprisingly simple make at that. In fact, this pair of slippers has a very long legacy with its brand, Daniel Green, that actually still exists today. Daniel Green started his company back in the 1880s. He was working as a shoe salesman and came across a piano felt maker. They had a lot of extra wool felt and he thought that would make for the perfect pair of slippers. So as of 1881, he partnered with that felt manufacturer to start making wool felt shoes. This of course meant that they weren't being made by a shoe manufacturer, so it's a very simple construction that doesn't require any shoe making tools. Which is why I thought it'd be absolutely perfect to pull a pattern from, reproduce, and share the pattern and how to make these with everyone. They were such an incredibly popular style. In fact, by the 1890s, Daniel Green had grown from just a few hundred pairs to selling thousands and thousands of pairs of wool felt slippers. They were putting out these large article advertisements talking about how much healthier they were than leather shoes, which when you think about around the house in terms of keeping your feet warm and keeping them dry, it really does make a lot of sense. And that's what they advertised. These didn't seem to catch on as shoes to wear outside nearly as much for obvious reasons. They were still being made entirely in wool felt, the soles included. So they really were suited better to indoor wear and keeping your feet nice and cozy. As we move in to the early 20th century, that's when the comfy slipper starts being advertised. And it's a simplified version at the very beginning, but by 1907, I can find advertisements for the exact style that I have. It's not patented until 1908, but it is clearly the same shoe, even being sold in the Wedgwood Blue box that I have with the slippers as well. And by this point, they had started to change the styling a little bit in terms of the variety. It not only came in this slipper style, which eventually became known as the Peerless slipper, but it was also sold in different boots and different other styles. They had men's styles as well that didn't have the ribbon and the pom-poms, but instead had a little decorative felt cutout or embroidery on the toe. They had more and more styles as they went along. They added a leather sole to the bottom of many of these styles. They particularly mentioned one of the advertisements that it is elk leather, which makes sense because it's very thin and pretty soft as well. And the comfy slipper continued to be sold in numerous different styles for quite a while. I found a very similar style that popped up in 1920 that's pretty much the exact same version, just with no ribbon and little crescent shapes for the cuts along the felt trim instead of straight ones to feed the ribbon through. So slight variations over the year, but the exact style that I have continued to be sold up to at least 1940. As of that point, things started to change a little bit. The general construction of the comfy slipper stayed the same, meaning that they have layers of the leather or a wool felt on the bottom for the sole, wool roving for the padding in between, a wool felt insole, and the entire upper being made out of a very simple construction of wool felt as well. So everything in terms of that shape, the slight wedge heel in back, really stays the same well into the mid 20th century. I was finding shoes from the 1950s and 1960s that are still very, very similar in advertisements and in vintage shoes being sold on Etsy and eBay. So this style is very universal and clearly means that it was incredibly comfortable as the name attests and sold very well if they really didn't change the style much at all for literally decades along the way. Which brings us back to the original pair that I have. I can find that they mentioned selling colors like this all the way through the 19 teens. Nothing really changes much in terms of its style between that roughly 1907 to 1940 period. So I don't have an exact date for this pair, even with the Wedgwood blue box, nothing really changed, but that just means that it's a really universal style. Not only is it going to be cute for everyday wear around the house, but honestly, if you're doing anything historical, this is a really universal piece of footwear and seems like a brilliant idea to have around for putting on after a long night of dancing. I did pull a pattern off of the original and sort of adjusted the sizing just a little bit to bring it closer to what we expect for modern widths. Then I worked the sizes up and down in order to have a size range from size 4 to size 13 for US women's. So the PDF for that is in the link below. It will take you to my Patreon where you can download that. It's available to everyone, so don't worry, it's not behind a paywall. And I'm going to take you through how to adjust those sizes. So if you have a half size, if you need a wider width or a narrower width, you need to adjust any of the other parts to this, I'm going to take you through the process for adjusting the patterns as well as step 
step-by-step -step construction for the whole thing. I promise it's a fairly simple design. There's a few little spots that gave me some trouble, but I'll walk you through what those are and make sure that you don't do the same things that I did. But all in all, it's an adorable little shoe. It is so comfortable. I ended up making quite a few pairs of these for friends and family for Christmas, so it's great for gifting, but it is definitely the perfect cozy winter project. So let's head upstairs to the studio and get started. First, we're going to deal with patterning. If you take a look at the PDF, you'll notice the very first thing is a chart that has both the recommended foot sizes as well as the shoe sizes. Then there is a rainbow nested version where you can see all of the sizes up against each other and then each individual size. Now I've done this in US women's sizes. It's only whole sizes because when you look at the nested pattern, you're going to see the fact that there's not a whole lot of difference even between whole sizes. So if you do need a half size in between two, I recommend printing off on either side and then tracing in between the two, just directly down the middle. But what I generally recommend, regardless of what size you think you are, or even if you're European sizing and you have no idea what that is in American, I highly recommend instead start with measuring your feet because a lot of times our sizes that we choose are not based off of the length of our foot but more off of the style of the shoe and the width of our foot and the proportions and where everything lines up so you may find in this particular slipper that it doesn't fit like you're used to it's much softer much stretchier it's going to have different proportions than say a pair of high heels and you might need something slightly different Again, what I've got in my chart is recommended, so you will have a lot of play in this whether you choose to have more or less toe room. I've given a fair amount of space just because these are slippers, I want them to be comfy, and the toes are pretty flat as you get towards the end, so I want to make sure everyone has toe space. So if anything, I might have sized these slightly too big when it comes to overall length. However, first things first, we're going to start with measuring the feet. All I want you to do is find a buddy. They don't have to have any clue what they're doing when it comes to sewing or anything like that. This just makes it a lot easier if you can. If you can't, it's okay. The reason why it's helpful to have a second person is because I need you to sit in the chair with your knees straight out in front of you and your feet flat on the floor. Don't let the knees start spreading out to the side. Don't let the feet start spreading either because we want the weight very evenly placed. And you're going to set your feet on a hard flat surface with a piece of paper underneath. And we're just going to trace. It's helpful to have a second person doing this because we don't want to be leaning over our feet and putting weight on them. So the first tracing is done very vertical, straight up and down. The second one is done at an angle underneath the foot. So essentially we're seeing where the foot is at its widest, as well as where the foot actually gets close to touching the ground. The next thing I need you to do is to look at the widest part of your foot, where the joint is, we call the ball of the foot sometimes, and take a tape measure and have someone measure around that. Pull snugly, not to the point where it's uncomfortable by any means but this is usually a pretty squishy part on a person. It's good to not have a really super loose measurement here. The ease we can add into the shoe itself. We don't want to add the ease into the measurements of the body. So measure that circumference, mark that down, measure both feet. They're going to be different. These are the three measurements we're going to carry over into the chart. Start out by looking at the overall length of your foot to figure out which size you should go with. Then we'll be taking a look at the width across the narrower portion of the foot, the bottom of the foot that actually touches the ground, and we'll be looking at the circumference. If you're finding that the circumference is quarter inch or more off from the recommended size, then you might want to make some adjustments. In this case, we're looking at something that is three quarters of an inch off. So I know that I need to make some adjustments to make it wider. Now, where exactly do I want to make those adjustments? There's a couple places. First off, we're going to take a look at these three major pieces, the sole, the U-shaped upper piece, and the little vamp. The sole is the most obvious and easy one to make adjustments to. Especially if it's a wider foot that's flatter, this is where you want to start. Lay down the sole shape on top of your foot shape and take a look at how it matches up. In this case, the foot is just a little bit wider than the B with sole. So I'm going to end up making this a little bit broader on the sole. I don't want to go way further out because it's going to extend too far beyond the foot. So I just need a little bit of extra space there. I'll start the curves closer down to where the waist is, the narrowest part of the shoe. I don't need to make that portion wider. I just want to make it wider at the ball of the foot. This is also really useful if you have a ball of foot that's in a slightly different place. I'm also noticing that the heel is quite a bit narrower on the version that I'm looking at than on my pattern. So I'm actually going to narrow out the heel just slightly. I'm tracing out a little bit of both the outer and the inner foot just to really make sure that I'm doing this correctly. You can see that there will be parts that extend beyond where the sole is. That's okay as long as it's not the 
inner portion. The bottom of the foot needs to hit the floor on the sole, but any of the upper portion of the foot that's further out is okay. So taking a look at the toes, I can see, especially with that little toe on the side, that's going to really pinch in there. So I'm going to extend the two sides to make sure I accommodate the joints as well as the toes of the foot. I don't need this to be a really big difference. I really just want to go a hair outside of where the foot is. So though sometimes you will extend the toe slightly when you're making a wider width shoe. In this case, the toe is already almost an inch away from the end. I don't think this slight change that I'm making to the sole shape is really going to affect the overall look of the shoe that much, so I don't feel like I need to extend the toe length to make a wider width here. The joints do line up to where the widest part of the sole is, so I don't have to worry about moving that forward or backwards, and again going in and just cleaning things up in the heel area, which will help it to grip to the back of the heel a little bit better. If you find that your shoes slip all the time in back, you may have a slightly narrower heel and want to take this in a little bit just depends on what the pattern looks like on top of your foot. Overall, by adjusting just beyond where the foot width actually sits, I ended up with just over a quarter of an inch added to the sole, which does mean that I should end up with a little bit less than half of an inch when I take care of adjusting the upper size. If anything, I might not actually need to put that much into the upper just because I left quite a bit of ease in the shoe because it is so squishy. Even though the finished measurement is quite a bit bigger than the recommended measurement, a lot of that gets taken up by the adding of the wool and the squishiness there, by the adding of the wool batting inside of the insole and all of that squishiness in the layers in between. Overall, I found that that lost about half an inch, but again, it's a very squishy half an inch. Once I am sure of my lines, I want to measure out the difference in circumference of the foot. So I can find on one side that I added about a sixteenth of an inch, on the other I added about an eighth of an inch, so I know that the upper needs to grow a little bit as well in order to match up correctly. I could extend the back of the U-shaped piece, but honestly I don't think that would be extending it in the right place. If anything, I want just a little bit more space towards the front where I am putting the extension. Thankfully the nice thing is the method for adjusting the width of the uppers are going to get to also allows us to give just a little bit more length to that u-shaped piece as well i am taking in the heel a little bit if anything i might be taking in the back of the u a smidge if i was making the heel a lot bigger then i would want to extend the back portion of the u in terms of extending the uppers there's a few ways that you can go about this, but I'm going to show you what I think is the most logical way. When we extend the sole, it's pretty straightforward. You're just extending the overall width. However, if you go to the upper, to that U-shaped piece, and you extend the bottom where that seam is, you're just going to end up with a weirdly shaped shoe on the bottom. It's just like the sole dips down at the back of the shoe where we have the extension. If I try to just widen the curve of the U-shape there, right over the joint of the foot, we're going to end up with another little dip for the sole. Instead, we want to add to the top of the dome in order to make it larger. The easiest way that I found to do this is not to go with the seam. You can redraw the seam. If you feel more comfortable doing it that way and it makes more sense to you, go ahead. But I think going down the center and splitting it makes a lot more sense because you aren't playing around with the curves all that much and messing with that. So I just drew a really quick line down the center of this model so you could see what it looks like. You can cut your pieces directly down the center. They don't have to be taped together to do this. I just think it makes it a little clearer. And all we're going to do is essentially insert a wedge. And you want to add the amount that you need for that circumference across that widest part of the foot, which you can see on the sole. So it'll end up being a little bit more than half an inch at the top. This is also the same way that you can take in the shoe if you find that you need it a little bit more narrow overall as well. So we're just going to add in a wedge, just physically tape in a piece of paper in order to match everything up. And we'll also be able to do it down at the toe. I won't take this whole thing apart just to show you that, but we'll be adding that eighth of an inch that I'm missing out of the circumference in down at the point of the toe and making a wedge the whole way up that gets wider from eighth of an inch to just over half an inch at the very end. This is the result of what that looks like on paper once I've traced out the new pattern versus the old pattern. You can see the wedge there, really tiny wedge on the U-shaped piece splaying things out and a slightly larger overall wedge on the vamp, but they are the same lines and run into each other. All I need to do now is connect the two pieces so I have a smooth curve. You might need to extend those curves just a little bit or take them in in order to make them really smooth, but that's all we're going for here. Clean up the lines that we don't need anymore to make sure that everything stays nice and clear, and we now have our newly fitted out upper. 
For the vamp, same sort of thing. We just need to connect the two lines to make sure that they are smooth down at the bottom. We're not doing any major adjustments and extend across the top. I do find in this particular case that since that vamp area has such a broad tongue to it that I might want to narrow that in very slightly just for aesthetics. So all I'm gonna do is curve it just a little bit further in where it connects to the U-shape upper so that way this becomes a little bit narrower across the top of the foot, but it's not a huge change, just a tiny little bit. Make sure you transfer all of your marks. And then we have to figure out how to adjust all of the tiny pieces that are for the trimmings. And we have to figure out how to adjust all the trimmings. When it comes to this little vamp piece, the trim is supposed to sit just an eighth of an inch, a couple millimeters away from the top edge. So start off by redrawing where that's supposed to sit. You can do this on a new sheet of paper. I'm just showing on top of the redrawn vamp so we can see it clearly. And I'm drawing that little bottom section at the center. And I'm going to scoot everything over so that way the curves match up with the new sides. And same thing, finish drawing that little line right there, draw from the bottom up, and we'll just combine those two curves and smooth them out just a little bit and then make sure that I go around the bottom edge and up. I will double check that this does match up with the other trims that sit on top but honestly those are just extension pieces and they just need to be long enough. The angle shouldn't have changed because we didn't change where those two pieces joined together. You'll also want to double check the extension pieces just to make sure that they are long enough or short enough especially if you extended or shortened that center back seam area. Make sure that all of the notches line up. If you've made any drastic differences, you may need to redraw those lines slightly differently in their spacing. These don't have to fit exactly, they just need to look proportional. The other piece you might want to adjust if you do anything dramatic in the heel area is the heel extension piece here. I honestly wouldn't really do very much to it unless you did something dramatic. You just might find that it matches up in a different spot. You might have to move your notches to make sure that it matches up correctly. The insole will also need to be adjusted if you change your sole, but it's the same shape as the sole just inset slightly and the toe is a little bit shorter just because I found it had to fit that way. Any new lines that you've drawn on the sole, you can just do the same exact extensions on the insole and it should fit the same way. If you've made adjustments, don't forget to go back in and add seam allowance again. Double check where you are putting seam allowance. However, based off of the pattern, not all edges have seam allowance and things like the insole have no seam allowance because they're going to be put in edge to edge. Now, if you've made a bunch of adjustments and you aren't sure that everything fits together, or if you just want to double check that this is going to work for your foot, I do highly recommend going ahead, making up a little paper sample shoe. This is how I was checking the whole way through the process to make sure that I was coming up with pieces that matched. I want to note at this point that there is a little bit of extra ease added to this long U-shaped piece down at just the toe. So there might be just a little bit of rippling there when you match things up correctly. That's good. You want some extra space there. And you'll also notice the fact that I didn't tape the insole into this. So if I try this on, my foot's going to be sitting a little bit lower in back than it actually will in the finished version. That's okay. We're mostly just trying to make sure that it fits across the front of the foot, to be honest. So you can go ahead and tape this together. Just keep in mind, this will not have flexibility like the actual shoe will. This is not going to move easily with your foot, but it is a way to just give yourself a little bit of comfort and know that things match up and that you can get your foot into this. Once you have your pattern all settled, it is time to deal with the supplies. The original is made up of two different weights of wool felt. What you need is both a one millimeter roughly and a three millimeter felt. So the three millimeter is the one where it gets a lot more complicated. And in terms of the amount that you need, I, for all of the sizes that I did, which range from size six to size nine, ended up with an 18 by 18 sheet of the three millimeter. I definitely could have gone up a few more sizes without any problem. And then for the one millimeter, I only needed an eight by 12. So that, honestly, I didn't even need that much. It was a very small amount. It's just for the trimming. The main body of the shoe is made up of the much heavier three millimeter felt. For the bottom of the shoe, while the original slipper is made out of elk leather, and you still can find similar leather today, I ended up, for my purposes, using a kangaroo leather because that's what I have on hand. It's a very similar weight, though I did find it was just a smidge stiffer than the elk leather. So elk, deer, anything that is fairly thin and lighter weight. I have recommendations for all of these down below. The wool felt I specifically got from a company that had both the three millimeter and the one millimeter. And 
And they also had the other thing that really helped me out, which was tassels. So as you might have noticed, there are little pom-poms on the original shoe, and I don't want to have to take the time to make my own, truly and honestly. All you really need are these little tassels. I went with ones that are about an inch and a half long, not because I needed them this length, I actually need them a fair bit shorter, but because if I go smaller in length, they're also going to just be smaller overall and not as full. And this is about the fullness that I needed. These are cotton. And you can definitely do the same thing out of a cotton floss and just unwrap all of the threads individually and make up little tassels this way. But Buying these ahead of time made this so much easier. As you'll see, we just cut them down and cut them open and they make the perfect little pom-poms. In addition to the wool felt and the leather and the tassels, you will also want some wool roving. This doesn't have to be this color. This is just what I had left over from projects for tailoring. You can use polyfill or any of those other types of fillers as well. I've just generally found that those will flatten down with time a lot faster than the wool will. Additionally, you'll want about a yard, quarter yard and a half if you can, of an inch to inch and a half wide ribbon. And this can be satin or it can be a China silk ribbon. The original is done in a single face satin, but that was about what I needed to get around the uppers of this particular style. On top of that, you'll want some thread, not only for the machine, if you're doing everything on the machine, but you'll also want something slightly heavier for sewing in the insole. I used a 30 weight silk for mine, but you can definitely use a heavier weight cotton poly thread as well. It's not the end of the world. You just need something that's going to hold up a little bit better than regular weight machine thread. And that takes care of all of our supplies. We're ready to get started. I found that when I'm tracing out the patterns on lighter felt, pencil works really well. I white gel pen or chalk will do very well on darker tones. I'm marking out all of the trimming pieces first on a lighter weight felt. I am making sure to mark what the pieces are in an invisible spot. I'm working from the wrong side and I am doing a right and left even though there's no right side or wrong side on the felt just because the markings will be visible. I'm then going in and marking out where all of those little lines are supposed to be. You can either do that by poking a little hole in the pattern or by letting your pencil sit where it needs to and then pulling the pattern away and marking that spot. I was just marking out the dots because I found that much clearer than marking out the lines when it comes down to cutting. For then cutting out the trimming pieces, I'm starting off with the straight edges. I alternated the trimming so that we've pinked edges match up and the straight edges match up so everything works together and I don't have a lot of waste. I have a very small pair of pinking shears for this. Don't worry about the size of this. It's just a matter of aesthetics. So if you have pinking shears that have a much larger zigzag to them, that's also just fine. And some of the later 1920s versions seem to have a much larger zigzag as well. This is just what I had on hand. And you'll see that the zigzags are only on the one side of the extensions, which is on the pattern, and it's only on the bottom edge of the vamp trim. When it comes to cutting the openings, you can use something like a buttonhole chisel, buttonhole scissors. I chose to go with a little chisel for this just because I felt like it gave me a really straight line. You can also use a very small pair of sharp scissors. So you can stick the point in at one dot and then cut straight to the next dot. I found that sometimes this wasn't quite as perfect of a system, but it works just fine. When it comes to the larger felt, some of the edges are done straight and some of the edges are done with the pinking shears. I found it easiest to make sure that I cut everything out straight first and then I went back and cut out the edges for the pinking shears. So it allowed me to not have to keep rethinking it for every piece. You'll note that I not only mark out the edges where I'm cutting, but also marking which piece it is and where things are going to match up. So making sure you have all your markings visible once they are cut out. After all the straight cuts are made on those pieces, then going back in and working with the pinking shears. I try to match up the zigzags as I go so I don't end up with an uneven pattern. And the final piece that I have to cut out is the sole. This I'm choosing to do out of leather. You can do it out of a felt like the earlier versions, of course, or out of some sort of leather substitute if you don't want to use leather. I, however, had some really lightweight kangaroo sitting around and it seemed to be pretty perfect for the job. I'm making sure that the, the orientation marks also get made on the leather and then I'm wetting them down very lightly. I found that since my leather was a little bit stiffer than I wanted, this really helps in the final step of turning. You just want to make sure they're still damp by the time you get to that point. All the final pieces for one shoe visible here with the uppers, the insole, the sole, the heel piece, and the trimmings. We're starting off with seaming up the trimming. There are two tiny little eighth inch seams that connect everything together. These will be flipped towards the wrong side and hidden. So it's right sides together. I like to go in and cut off the very 
top corner of the seam before laying it flat just in case it does extend to be on the top line. Ironing both of those open as well as you can since they are so tiny and ideally everything matches up. I like to match up the zigzag at the bottom and trim up the straight line if they don't match exactly. So I always match the zigzag at the bottom first. Next up we're dealing with assembling the upper. This is a little bit more complicated. First up we are doing wrong sides together, which is the opposite of the normal way. We're going to have the seam towards the outside. So I'm matching up the little vamp piece just offset of the zigzag. I don't want it to go the full width of the zigzag, just to the inner lower portion. And it's just a very tiny 1 8 inch, roughly 4 millimeter seam, very small. I found it was much easier to just put the needle down, scooch both of them slightly, take one or two stitches, scooch them again to match them up rather than trying to pin or clip them together. It just got to be a very complicated piece very quickly if I was trying to hold things together before I started sewing. So if I just tried to match things up as I went, took each stitch individually as I needed to to make it around the curves and line everything up until I get back to the straight of way and continue on. And double check that you end up really close to your orientation marks at both ends of the seam. Then I am ironing it flat from the inside to make sure that that seam sits upright. We're not trying to open it up. We just need the entire piece to feel flattened. So you can see the zigzag and the flat seam are both sitting upright, but the entire piece feels fairly flat underneath. Then I'm starting to apply the trim. Thankfully with wool felt, everything kind of sticks to itself. So I don't have to use a lot of pins or clips to keep everything in place. The important place to match everything up is where the two pieces of the upper connect. So you want to make sure that it's not too low or too high there. And that's where the trim is most important to have it matched up and up around the curve of the vamp. Thankfully, everything stretches and shrinks pretty easily. So you can work things into place even if the pattern is not exactly perfect. Coming off the end there, I have a little bit of extra for the trim so I don't go all the way to the end of the trim. I'm then going and doing the second line of top stitching close to the zigzags. Again, only about an eighth of an inch or so off on both of these pieces, close enough to the edge to hold it down, but that you aren't running off the edge. I'm then going to trim off any excess that I have for that little bit of trim at the end before I take care of the center back seam. I want to make sure that I am matching up the tops and the trim more importantly than the bottom. The bottom's going to go into seam allowance. So the bottom doesn't have to match perfectly. The top is more important. Pressing that open the same way that I did with the other seam before. So it'll stick out in the back, but because it's felt, it's not a big problem. Next up is stitching the heel extension. The straight side gets attached to the upper and the curved side will get attached to the sole. So making sure that it's centered up over the center back seam and stitching close to the ends on both sides. You can go all the way to the end, that's fine. I just usually stop just before falling off the edge. And this will get pressed open in the same way as the previous seams. And now we have our heel extension on and we are ready to attach the whole thing to the sole. It will be kind of a weird spot to go over that heel extension where it seems on, but we'll just treat it like it's one piece. When it comes to stitching onto the sole, this is where it's been giving me the most trouble. Starting with the alignment point that is to the right of the toe. I don't want to start at the very top center of the toe because that's where the fullness is going to be scooted in. So that toe area is going to have some extra fullness we'll deal with at the end. The rest of it should be pretty straightforward and not have to be shoved or cramped in to meet those points along the way. You want to make sure that as you're going, things aren't stretching and moving and that you're matching up those orientation points. The center back is particularly important when it comes to dealing with the heel extension, just go straight over that seam. Don't worry about stopping and starting again. And when we get to the toe, that's where the extra will kind of get shoved in there in order to end up with a little bit of a rounded space around the toe. Again, I found this was so much easier to do gradually stitch by stitch, section by section, than trying to clip everything and pin it together. I did end up finding my first version of this. I ended up a little bit off with my orientation, so I had to stop, double check what I was doing, make sure I lined it back up, start stitching again, and then finish up all the way around the toe. So it's okay if you have to stop and start. It will leave permanent marks in the leather, so the less you do that, the better but it will still happen. It's on the bottom of your foot. It's not a big deal. 
Once that's finished, we're going to be pressing the seam with our fingers in order to push the leather into a good curve. So this is why having slightly damp leather can really help here. It's much more pliant. It's not really something you can press with heat of an iron in the same way. Leather doesn't like heat like that. It's a lot easier to work with a damp sole. If it's dry too much, you can go back in with a paper towel and just wet it down a little bit. Just make sure to do it evenly, otherwise it can stain. Once the seam is opened up, then you can shove the heel portion down in. We're going to be stitching the insole in by hand and it's going to be stitched to the upper, not to the heel extension. I'm putting a few marks around this once I've got it laid into the correct place to make sure that as I'm squishing the seam allowance in, I'm still matching things up. You'll know, have to sort of ease in around the toe with the seam allowance, so you want to make sure that you're doing the correct amount and having those orientation marks will really help. We're just whip stitching over. Don't go through the leather, just go through the wool felt for both. And it's just a really tiny little whip stitch just far enough in to get a bite. Again, when you get to that toe, we're going to be easing it in. So go just a little bit further apart with each stitch for the outside or the upper versus the insole. Once you get a couple of inches down around the toe, knot things off. You don't have to cut the thread yet, just temporarily keep the needle out of the way. This is where we want to start putting in the wool roving. I find that taking a piece that's about sole shaped in terms of width and shoving it down in, which is why we stopped stitching before we could no longer reach to the toe, works really well. You don't need a ton of wool roving underneath the main part of the foot. Most of it will go into the back. So I'm just feeding it in there so that way there's enough to get a bit of squish under the foot. I will get back to adding more in the heel area once we get a little bit further, but I'm going to go ahead ahead and keep stitching around the insole so that way we get down to the waist where the heel portion begins. Then I'm going back in and adding a couple more layers of wool roving. The way that it came to me in this case was in sheets already, so I found that three of these sheets worked really well to pad out the heel and one that was kind of scrunched up did well under the foot. You might want to play around with this depending on what you're filling it with so you have more or less, but it doesn't need to be overstuffed. The original is really squishy and soft and it is definitely not hard packed at all. So you want it to be pretty squishy but have enough filth that you're going to have a little bit of cushion under the foot. Continuing around the back of the heel with those whip stitches, you might need to ease in around that curve as well. I like to leave a really long tail, so I'm just extending pretty far into the insole and trimming it off there. Then we have to turn our shoe right side out. Starting in the back of the heel portion, well, that's the easy bit. When it comes to the front area, that's where it's going to get a little bit more complicated. You might find it's a little lumpy as you first start turning to, that's perfectly fine. It'll ease up on your foot, trust me. I do find that you can squish the shoe in half a little bit to start the turn easier, but overall it is so much easier to turn a shoe if you have some sort of stick. I just use the back end of a hammer. You just need something that isn't sharp, isn't going to stain, and I usually put it on my lap so it's kind of awkward to show it this way, but you're just shoving that up in there and slowly working the end out. This is definitely a learning process in terms of how to get it done, and it might take a little while for you to get everything turned, but eventually it will pop through and you'll be good to go. Then it's just time for the trim. I recommend getting a large bodkin for this. If not, you can use a bobby pin. I just find that a bodkin works the best for making sure that your ribbon's not fraying out as you're working. With that first end, we're just going to tuck it down into the trim. You can go from the inside and stitch it down if you want to. You just need to make sure to not go towards the outside of the trim. I'm not worrying about stitching it down for this moment, however. The important thing as you're working the ribbon through is to make sure it's not twisting and turning and that you're laying it out so that way the gathering looks nice and the puffs look nice. It's not folding over, increasing on itself instead of giving you a nice puffy fullness. As you get to the curves around the front portion of the trim, you'll find that you'll end up kind of going uneven as you go since you're going around curve to the left and then a curve to the right. It evens up as you do a left curve and then a right curve. So wiggle the edges back and forth in order to get the curve nice and flat. When you come around to the very end, make sure that you have enough length to cross back over where you've already done one loop of the ribbon and you can just tuck it down inside. They just twist over each other on the original and they tuck it down inside of the trim in order to finish it off. Again, you can do some reinforcement stitches in a hidden spot in order to keep those in place if you're concerned about it. Next up, it's time for the pom-pom. 
which I mentioned I was just going to use a tassel and cut it down. So starting off with a tassel, I trimmed off about half an inch with my larger shears. Then I am going in and clipping that little tie around the outside. There are other ties inside keeping everything together, so I'm not too worried about the rest of it right now. I do often find when I do this that it's just a little bit too big still, definitely too big here. So you can go back and smoosh it together, trim it back down, trim around the edges this way. When you turn it over, it makes it much clearer if you're a little bit off on the circle and starting to go askew. Once you've gotten it trimmed down to the right size, however, I like to keep the little tie loop in the center because it gives me a place to anchor things. So I'll make sure that's exactly where I want it to be. And I'll start off by stitching with a heavier thread over that little loop. I usually do two or three stitches over the loop in different spots to make sure that that portion is tacked down before I come back up and try to go through the center of the pom-pom. This is a little bit awkward just because it's usually pretty bulky in the center area, but I like to spread everything out, come up through the center and back down again, trying to not catch any of the little threads along the way and that will anchor it through the center. You can do this a couple of times if you want to. To finish it off, I'm coming back up underneath the pom-pom and knotting it off on the upper side. It's a lot easier to do this where you can see it, and it's gonna be hidden, and it also then won't rub on the top of your foot. Mm -hmm. 